As we prepare to listen for the word of God read and proclaimed, let us join together in prayer. We give you thanks, O God, for your word spoken long ago and yet new every day. Give us again the gift of hearing your voice through these words. May they be a conduit for your spirit to enter our lives and take root, growing and giving glory to you. Amen. Today's first lesson from, is from the Hebrew scriptures, comes from Genesis chapter 40. We will be reading the, from the New Revised Standard Version. Some time after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he waited on them and they continued for some time in custody. One night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own meaning. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers, who were with him in custody in his master's house. Why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, We have had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms came out and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But remember me when all is well with you. Please do me the kindness to make mention of me to Pharaoh and to get me out of this place. For in fact, I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should have put me into the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there were, there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered, This is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a pole, and the birds will eat the flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his cupbearing, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But the chief baker he hanged, just as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. This ends our first reading. Okay, I know there's a lot of scripture this morning, but it's important Joseph stories, right? So it's hard to cut it all out. So our second reading this morning is an edited version of the 41st chapter of the book of Genesis. So if you are reading along in the Pew Bibles, I'm going to skip over some verses, so it'll be okay. Because <laughs> it's, it's a long passage. <clears throat> so again, we'll be reading from an edited version of the New Revised Standard Version. After two years... 
Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile, and there came up out of the Nile seven sleek and fat cows, and they grazed in the reed grass. Then seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. The ugly and thin cows ate up the seven sleek and fat cows, and Pharaoh awoke. Then he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. Seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. Then seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind, sprouted after them. The thin ears swallowed up the seven plump ears, and Pharaoh awoke. It was a dream. In the morning his spirit was troubled. So he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my faults today. Pharaoh has in custody a young Hebrew who can interpret dreams as he interpreted to us, so it turned out. Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was brought out of the dungeon. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said that you, uh, when you hear a dream, can interpret it. And Joseph answered the Pharaoh, It is not I. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Then Pharaoh relayed the dream to Joseph, and he said, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what the Lord is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, as are the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind. They are seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh. God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. After them there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land. The plenty will no longer be known in the land because of the famine that will follow, for it will be very grievous. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dreams means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will bring it about shortly. Joseph continued, Now therefore let Pharaoh select a man who is discerning and wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. The Pharaoh proceeded to appoint overseers over the land, and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plenteous years. Let them gather all of the food for these good years that are coming and lay up the grain under the authority of the Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. The food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to befall the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. The proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find anyone like this, one in whom is the Spirit of God? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only with regard to the throne will I be greater than you. Removing his signet ring from his hand, Pharaoh put it on Joseph's hand. He arrayed him in the garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. Thus, Joseph gained authority over the land of Egypt. The seven years of plenty that prevailed in the land of Egypt came to an end. And the seven years of famine began to come, just as Joseph had said. There was famine in every country, but throughout the land of Egypt there was bread. And since the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses 
and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the world came to Joseph to buy grain because the famine became severe throughout the world. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So last week, I promised you that we would be spending a few weeks with Joseph, did I not? So I'm fulfilling my promises here. Last week, we began with Joseph, a journey that showed us how devastating sibling rivalry can truly be. We learned that Joseph was not an easy traveling companion. While I am sure that he was a very godly man, he did not seem to have a clue how to get along with those closest to him. He was an entitled, coat-wearing young man, and the world was his oyster. It was his oyster, that is, until his brothers had had enough. They grew tired of his favoritism and the dreams that he was given, and so they wanted to put an end to that. They wanted to put an end to his dreams. And so they threw him into a pit and sold him into slavery in Egypt. And by doing this, they thought that this was the end of their brother. They thought that this was the end of his dreams. But God, who is not present actively in this text, had other plans. Feeling despair unlike anything he had felt before, Joseph was taken down into Egypt, and he could not understand what was going on. His brothers, his brothers had thrown him into a pit. His brothers had sold him into slavery. How could this be happening to him, he wondered. How? What had I I done, he thought to himself. My family has abandoned me. He felt, as I bet you can imagine, alone, abandoned, and forgotten. But God did not abandon him in that pit. God did not abandon him on that slave train down into Egypt. When Joseph was sold to an officer of the Pharaoh, the Lord was with him and helped him to prosper, helped him to rise to a position of power in the household of that officer. But once again, Joseph was filled with despair after being wrongfully accused of an inappropriate relationship with the master's wife. And that is how Joseph ended up in prison with the baker and the cup bearer. There in the Pharaoh's prison, Joseph again felt abandoned and forgotten and despair unlike anything he had ever experienced. But God did not abandon him. God did not leave Joseph alone. The Lord's blessing was upon him. And soon the chief jailer placed Joseph in a position of power, a position that ended up bringing him into direct contact with the Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker after they had been thrown into jail by the Pharaoh. And as we heard today, one night they were both disturbed by dreams. And even though the dreams were pretty obvious, if you ask me, they could not seem to figure them out and what they meant. And they were greatly, greatly troubled. But Joseph, the receiver of dreams knows a thing or two about dreams. And so they listen to him. Joseph, as if the dreams were not even a challenge, launched right into an interpretation 
much to the delight of the cupbearer who lifted that cup back to the pharaoh, and much to the chagrin of the baker who had his head lifted off of him. Joseph was hopeful that this situation would change around his life and bring him back into wholeness and back out into the freedom of the world. But the cupbearer forgot him. And so there he sat in prison for another two years. Two more years in prison for a crime he actually didn't commit. But God did not forget Joseph. And God certainly did not abandon him. It was not until Pharaoh began to have his own dreams to the that the cupbearer somehow conveniently remembered and then convinced the Pharaoh to rescue Joseph from prison. In his panic and probably glee to get out of jail, I think it would have been easy for Joseph to take credit for his ability to interpret dreams, to make himself more important so that maybe the Pharaoh would change his plight But Joseph had learned to give credit where credit is due. It is not I. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Joseph does indeed interpret the Pharaoh's dreams, explaining how Egypt would enjoy seven years of bountiful harvests, harvests so plentiful that the Pharaoh would not even be able to imagine it. But those years would be followed by an unimaginable famine, a plague unlike anything they had ever experienced, unlike anything Egypt had ever seen. And recognizing the discerning spirit of God upon Joseph, Pharaoh puts him in charge of all the land. No one is greater in Egypt other than the Pharaoh himself. And Joseph, Joseph took full advantage of this new station in life. But not for himself. He took advantage of this new station, this new power that he enjoyed for everyone else. He made sure that everyone stored up the treasures of harvest for seven years to delay the gratification that they must have felt to be receiving such bounty, such treasure. But he made them store it up because he knew what was in store. And when the famine struck and the fates fell, he opened Pharaoh's storehouses so the people did not perish. He did not keep those doors closed so that the rich and powerful had what they wanted for as long as they needed it. He opened up the storehouses so that all of Egypt could be fed, so that all of the world could come to buy what they needed. And all the world ended up coming to see Joseph because God did not abandon Joseph. And through Joseph, God did not abandon all creation. Our man Joseph, I think, is a significantly different person on this end of his journey than when we began with him last week. Gone is the pompous tattletale who just wanted to rat out his brothers. And here we find a discerning man trying to live into who God has created him to be so that others could experience the bounty that God has to offer. At the beginning of our journey, Joseph was young and obnoxious who had the world handed to him on a plate. But we know that journeys change people, don't we? Journeys change our hearts They give us 
lived world experience. Help us to find our place in all of it. Like Joseph, all of us have encountered pitfalls that challenge how we understand our place in the world. Like Joseph, we all have experienced challenges that have humbled our egos and made us more open to new understandings of how we are to be in the world and to live and move and have our being. Journeys rarely take the path we always thought they would. And sometimes, like Joseph, we are forced to take paths that we would not choose to journey down. In college, I wanted to be a vet. Couldn't really pass chemistry. Wanted to be a math teacher. Calculus. Not my thing. Not me. History and geography. There we go. We learn as we go. But some of the challenges we face are much deeper and graver than a college major. Am I right? A company falters and has to cut jobs. And suddenly we are looking for new employment. You wonder why we have, you have that pesky cough that will not go away, only to discover that cancer has come calling and it changes the trajectory of your life. Your parent or your child becomes ill, causing you to go through, throw away your calendar, throw away all the plans that you had at work or in your personal life to spend time where you are truly, truly needed. A disaster strikes, burning away the keepsakes that you have built up over a lifetime, the memories and treasures that you have stored away, or an entire community has stored away. My friends, the list can go on and on. We, like Joseph, encounter unexpected and sometimes unwanted detours in our life all the time. Joseph was forced down many paths that he did not sign up for. He was thrown into a pit. He was sold into slavery. He was falsely accused and thrown into jail for adultery. He was ignored and forgotten by people that he thought were his friends and that would come and rescue him from jail. Joseph was forced down many paths that he did not choose in his own journey. But on those paths, Joseph discovered an important thing. He discovered the presence of God was still with him. He discovered the presence of God was still working for him and through him. Wherever, wherever he found himself. And Joseph began to trust. He began to trust in God's power to bring about good things, even in the midst of stress and illness and sadness. He began to trust in the power of God's grace to work in and through him so that the world around him could be better for all people everywhere. He began to trust more in God than he did in himself for the first time in his life. Joseph has learned and now stands as a model of the godly life. But what I think is so important about Joseph is we always think people blessed by God have these perfect lives. Oh, look, they have everything they could ever imagine. But here in Joseph, he had a life lived in the full range of the human experience. His life was not absent from change and turmoil. 
and stress and sickness and famine and heartache. His life reflects the complexities of our human experience and at the same time a joy that comes in serving God with all that he has been given. When the Pharaoh himself finally calls upon Joseph to interpret a dream and then to guide Egypt through the crisis that dream foretold, Joseph does not flinch. He does not shy away. He does not say, that is not for me. He does not allow the power of his new position to make him blind to the needs of the world. Instead, he trusts in the power of God. He trusts in the grace present in his life so that he can become an agent of God's grace for the whole world, opening up all that he has so that all people can come and be fed and be given what they need. There is no doubt that these unwanted paths are difficult. There is no doubt that they can be painful, uncomfortable, torturous. But there is also no doubt that God's presence is at work in you and through you when these changes happen. There is no doubt that God never, ever forgets you, abandons you, leaves you to go through it on your own. Many in our world find themselves on new and unwanted pathways. They have become victims of wildfires. They have become victims of other natural disasters. They are living in countries torn apart by war or famine or coups. They are living with the reality of rampant gun violence that impacts their lives each and every day. They are living in the shadow of newfound medical debt. It is easy to throw up our hands and say, where is God? It is easy for us to throw up our hands and say, this is just too much. Nothing can be done. But Joseph reminds us what trust looks like. Joseph reminds us that God never abandons us or leaves us alone. Joseph invites us to trust in the grace of God at work in your life this day and every day and to allow that grace to work in and through you so that you might become a blessing to everyone in your midst and to the world over. Friends, there's a lot of work to be done. Dreams and nightmares are becoming reality all around us, which means that each of us has the opportunity to become an agent of grace. Grace for this congregation. Grace for Northeast Ohio. Grace for the world that so desperately needs to experience God's love, God's peace, and God's joy. You are invited to place your trust in the power of God to do far more with you and through you than you could ever hope to do on your own. You are invited like Joseph before you, to place your trust in the one who journeys with you and through you to the far parts of the world.
to trust and follow, knowing the power of God is with you if you are in a pit. If you are forced into things that you did not want to do. Remember. Remember where your help comes from. You'll never face a valley alone. Because God is there with you. Working in and through you for your good. And for the good of the world. Amen.